so uh, I'm White Flame Online. Excuse me if I'm a little under the weather, but um, yeah, let's get this started. I mean, Commodore Basic V2 is probably one of the crappiest basics on this class of machine, but um, it's still better than PowerPoint, huh? All right, so I'm going to be presenting my 16-bit byte-coded environment that runs on top of the 6502. Uh, it's called Akron VM, and this talk can probably be called 16-bit code on the 6502, taking a bit too far down the path of masochistic optimization. Um, yeah, this has been a, a playground back burner project for me for a very long time. It's been congealing over many, many years as I try different approaches on implementing a better um, byte-coded 16-bit uh, platform for creating higher level language programs, for being able to handle 16-bit values better, being able to dereference 16-bit pointers uh, better. And um, I'm gonna talk about what I wanted to do different than existing systems, uh, the downsides of existing systems, and kind of the designs that I ended up with. This is going to be a very low-level talk, so I presume that people are at least familiar with 6502 assembly. Is that a common thing here? People know 6502? Yeah. I know a lot of familiar faces out there as well. Um, I'm going to be referencing Suite 16 that is um, in the Apple II ROMs. It is effectively a code compression scheme for representing 16-bit operations in a byte-coded interpreter is fairly similar to what I have. You can sort of consider Akron VM as a much more powerful, much more extensible version um, of what Suite 16 offers. Um, Suite 16 is kind of limited, but it definitely accomplishes the task of reducing code size for 16-bit operations. I'm going to be referencing fourth a fair bit as well. Um, those are probably the two most well-known 16-bit environments for the 6502. So um, they're a good reference point to talk about. I'm going to be talking about ITC fourth, which is indirect threaded code. Um, that's the fourth model where, as you define words, it lists a bunch of 16-bit vectors pointing to the subwords of your word. And um, you know, that is an interpretive version. It's got to do a lot of, a lot of dispatch and indirection, um, as opposed to compiled fourths. Now, all compiled languages make more of a speed versus side trade-off that I'm going to do here that I'm going to get into later. And so, like, compiled for us will take the words definition and just inline it or just inline JSRs so you directly um, call the compiled code. But that, like I said, does increase the code footprint a lot. And you can take any byte-coded language and compile it in that way. So I'm going to try to compile, or compile, compare apples to apples um, by talking about ITC fourths, uh, specifically uh, fig fourth. So, Let's get into kind of the thinking around the design here. Um, the stuff that I was working on uh, that requires, or at least would benefit greatly from a 16-bit environment, are editors and tools. Um, I was working on the Hawkeye 2 video game. It was released a few years ago, a demo of it. Um, I was writing complex tools for it. They were difficult to edit because you have a bunch of dynamic objects that are pointing to each other and a bunch of runtime configurable stuff, um, whereas 6502 code really likes having statically allocated um, places in zero page and absolute memory where you can index from. Uh, code like that works really fast, but once you start doing a lot of indirection, a lot of you know, dynamically user-generated stuff, it's, it would really benefit from higher level tools. Um, multitasking is obviously something that a higher level um, language um, would, would benefit from. Now, Akron is not a high-level language. It's more like an assembly language that for a 16-bit CPU. But with multitasking, one of the big things, as well as with editors and tooling, is that you want the code size to be small. If you're doing a bunch of 16-bit operations, that really bloats up the code. Even if you're using macros to make it look nice in the source code, it's expanding to these big strings of like six, seven, eight, ten um, instructions, which takes up a lot of space. And when you're multitasking, you want your programs to be as small as possible so you can fit more programs. 
in memory. You know, with editors and tools, you want your code not to take up your entire memory. You want it to be small and leave the rest of the memory up to the user data. So you know, sort of like Suite 16, you want a good amount of code compression while not losing speed or expressive power. And GUIs, I mean, I was uh, with the GeckOS talk before, we referenced Linux a lot. And I was working with that um, you know, back in the day as well. Uh, one of my things was to implement a GUI for it. And you know, again, you're working with a lot of pointers, a lot of structures in memory that point to nested structures and, and doing a lot of pointer following, which is a very large code in 6502. It's, it's good to have some sort of high level, high level representation for it. Some of that ended up in Wheels OS, but that um, I still haven't brought it into any 6502 native uh, system. So some of the uh, some of the pieces of code that I want to write with this include memory allocation and garbage collection. Again, very pointer heavy. Um, more difficult to write in raw assembly. Exception handling is one that I've actually done relatively recently. And to be able to abstract a bunch of memory expansions. Um, I had a soft MMU that I wrote for Linux again, where you could reference up to 256 byte spans of memory that you allocate in banked memory expansions or in the REU that gets DMA'd in and out. But to write your code in a way that uses pointers that you get from a library or from an OS to nest through these, again, that's where you really need a system to, to express your 16-bit operations very directly. I also kind of think that you know, with the various multitasking OSs that have come out for the various 6502 systems, you know, it's been very, very difficult to write full-featured, large, complex applications in them. And I think that's what's, what's holding them back a little bit, that they need a higher level language in order to take care of some of this abstraction, pointer following, um, passing structures into systems um, when those structures are dynamically allocated or dynamically filled and stuff like that. So that's kind of what I want to do with this system or, or kind of where I started. And of course, once you start doing something, you start hitting the barriers between what you want and what you get. Yeah. So a lot of the pain points that we deal with in 8-bit coding is so you want it fast, or do you want it small, or do you want it powerful? And it's very easy to create an elegant specification for an instruction set architecture for 16-bit virtual CPU or whatever, um, define all these clean, modular, the parameterized features of it. And then when you get to implementing it, you find out that it's not going to be fast. It's going to be difficult to, to write, and that it is at odds with how the 6502 works, making the implementation large, and then you can't fit your years of code in there because your runtime is too big. So I mean, all of these are kind of trade-offs that we always make. I'm going to go into some real specifics as it comes to interpreters. Uh, instruction dispatch is the biggest one. If you have you know, your 16-bit fourth word pointers, or if you have your 8-bit your opcodes, you know, you actually have to decode that through a jump table or something. You have to increment a 16-bit uh, instruction pointer. And in fig fourth, at least, it takes 41 cycles to dispatch to executing a native word. Let's not do that. And in suite 16, as small as it is, um, because it has four-bit parameters packed in its opcode words, so four-bit opcode, four-bit parameter, as well as eight-bit opcodes. It takes, depending on which type of opcode you use, it takes 59 or 63 cycles, and these are best case times. If you wrap around a page or something like that, it'll take you know, four to eight more cycles. So it takes a substantial number of clock cycles to dispatch to the actual instruction implementations. And if you look at some of the native fourth words, like like drop or dupe or swap or something like this. These are used often in the fourth language um, simply to bring the proper values to the top of the stack so that you can work on them. And they're used very flippantly in the code because they're easy to throw in. And these instructions are anywhere from like four to 12 cycles in length of their operation used, like I said, very liberally in the code. But even though it's only four cycles to run a, a drop operation, which just increments the uh, X pointer twice to remove the bottom 16 word off of which is the head of the stack, it takes 41 cycles to issue 
that four cycle native word. So that's like a 10 to 1 ratio of just overhead in running the virtual machine, in dispatching to these instructions, and very little percentage of the time is actually spent doing the work that you've programmed that you want it to do. And again, in Suite 16, its, it's intent is to compress code, not necessarily to be the speed demon. And so the, uh, the overheads there are even larger. Um, so with, in, in general, a software dispatch system is going to be much slower than the hardware dispatch system. A hardware system can just wire up all the bits of the opcode to where they need to be, you know, trigger the right states in the state machine. But in a software CPU, you know, in a byte-coded emulated environment, interpreted environment, you kind of have to think about CISC versus RISC. How much work is being done in a single instruction? We want to reduce the number of instruction dispatches in order to get it to complete a unit of work. Like, for instance, in fourth, if you want to add six to the number that's on the top of the stack, first you have to push the number six, and then you call add. That's two instruction dispatches, versus something in 6502 where you say add six to the accumulator, that's only one instruction. And so those things really, really compound um, when you're actually counting cycles and looking at performance. So we want to be a little bit more of a CISC model um, there are opposite trade-offs that I'll get to later. Um, we have to think of the instruction ABI, just the internals of what does a dispatcher have to set up that the instruction expects its interface to be. What is AX, Y registers, what's the carry flag, you know, what does zero page look like in order for the instructions to run consistently. And the second one, after you've dispatched your instruction, how do you handle all the operands? You know, like uh, in 6502, you've got load A from zero page or for absolute memory you know, for all these. So I used to have packed bit fields in an earlier version of this. Again, where we've got you know, maybe two four-bit values in a single parameter by tune instruction. But once you get to implementing that instruction, you have to spend time and a lot of code breaking that up. You've got to juggle between your three meager registers on the 6502 to hold these various packed bit fields. And that's something I discarded to just single byte bit fields. Um, and let's say you have an add instruction. If you want to say our register three equals register one plus register two, are you going to have three operands on your instruction? Um, accumulator or top of stack systems have an implicit place where their, where their code will act on, where the, the value is that they will use. And so they don't have to specify as a parameter to the instruction which operand they're going to work on. However, there's a downside to that. You've got to always shuffle data in and out of those special magic places where it's optimized to work on. So the, uh, you know, we want to reduce the number of instruction or of operands. But if we reduce the amount of operands too much, then we increase the number of instructions. <laughs> so this is, you know, all, always in conflict. And again, we've got to, we've got to pull the instructions operand bytes from this 16-bit instruction pointer, and we want to avoid doing a bunch of 16-bit math, which is primarily why these things are dozens of cycles, because they're updating 16-bit pointers. And again, I touched on, on that already. Moving values in and out of a special accumulator place or top of stack, that really is one of these draining um, performance you know, hits on writing a, uh, a system. And it depends on if you're architecting to a register style or a stack style. If you have a special accumulator, you will run into this. And you know, I am looking at wanting to write high-level code, so I'm going to deal with functions that pass parameters and return values. Now, fourth is pretty good at this. Um, you just have the single stack that you're pushing values in, and when a function returns, it just leaves values on the stack. But you still have to worry about ordering them and always pushing them to the top of stack and bringing them forth. And that's a lot of, a lot of fiddly work in there. And if you don't have a stack, if you just have your your register file, you've got to save the old register values from the caller and then restore them after the system comes back. And all of this, and these are kind of the challenges that I, that I was dealing with looking at what is an uh, interpreted virtual machine on the C64 or on the 6502 in general. Nothing in this is C64 specific. Um, and all of these things are just plain and simple overhead. The, um, 
This is just kind of garbage that must be done to simply find and configure what you're going to do before you even do it. It's to shuffle data around to be in the magic place to get worked on. It's not actually the work that you're going to be doing to this. I mean, none of this stuff, none of it, none of this time spent has anything to do with executing the actual work that you as the programmer put into the system. It's just burning its own heat. And you know, I'm, I'm, honestly, I'm sick of all this overhead. I'm sick of making all these compromises and being constrained by the assumptions of all these prior models um, where they leave us with these compromises. So you know what? This is a hobby project. This is a back burner project for me. So I'm going to hobby the crap out of this thing. <laughs> Let's take that top assumption, fast or small or powerful. Nah. We're going fast and small and powerful, no compromises. I'm going to fiddle this thing until I get something better than uh, what's com going to come before. And uh, yeah, it's been many years <laughs> of, of throwing ideas at these specific problems. How do we reduce these compromises? How we, do we reduce these overheads without making other aspects of the system worse? Um, so you know, I talked before, if you create a gen gener generic model and try to implement it on 6502, you're kind of in conflict with what 6502 offers you versus what you want to build. And so kind of my approach over the years has been think of a feature, implement it completely in the VM, look at where the pain points are specifically in you know, 6502 code, running too slow or too complex for it. And then stepping back and saying, you know, well, what could I do simply in 6502 code? What does it offer me naturally? And then kind of percolate that up to the top level design, redefining my features. And this kind of is seeking a more holistic, new, full stack, top down, transparent from high level to low level, uncompromised solution um, to these specific, well, pet peeves of mine, shall we say. So with these points in mind that seem inescapable, with all these overheads and compromises, um, let's see what I came up with. Now, I do prefer a register file to stack programming, especially when performance um, is critical. Again, I'm, I'm not talking about compilers because compilers make a size trade-off that I'm kind of not willing to do in the projects that I want for this. Um, so what's really important here is the number of dispatches, again, that you need to do work and stack code. I mean, Forth is a, is a very mature and elegant and composable language. It does great stuff. But if you really break it down, there are a lot of instruction dispatches to set up every single parameter for every single low-level uh, word and then issuing a separate issue, uh, dispatch for the words. So I'm going to reduce those. Um, and registers also keep intermediate values live. They're not constantly being consumed off the stack and don't have to constantly be recopied around the stack in order to use them. So that's kind of my preference for registers. So in zero page, I have my quote unquote register file. Um, it was just three registers, R0, R1, R2, with some arbitrary values. And this is all in zero page. The addresses are increasing as we go to the right. So what I also have done with this is created a sliding window um, to use local registers. Now everything that I'm using here has come in the past. You know, they're not totally new ideas, but I think that integrating them properly um, yields a very unique system for the 6502. So say I am entering a scope or I'm entering a function and I want new local, uh, local variables, local registers, without having to throw these things away or restore them or anything. What I do is I say I want to call a function, I call a function. And this is Acheron syntax here. It looks fairly like assembly. And at the function label, I have an instruction called mgrow2. What this does is it grows my register frame. The M indicates that I mark where I am here, you know, what the registered state is that my caller uh, started me at, and I will grow this by two registers. Now, this operation is just a simple shifting of X, just like fourth might do with its top of stack pointer. But now what I have available to me are two new registers, R0 and R1 initialized, R2, R3, R4, are now the callers old R0, R1, R2. 
So all of its registers that it was working with, I can use as input parameters to my function. And as my function does some arbitrary work, it might write to R1, write to R2, reading from 2, 3, and 4, whatever its input parameters are, and its output parameters can be written directly into the caller's registers. So I know, I think it was uh, the, the UCSD P code machine on the on 6502. It actually created stack frame objects. And when you called a function, it would co copy all the parameters from the caller into the callee, run the callee, and then when it returned, it would copy the return values back into the caller space. And I want to get rid of all of those copies. And I think a sliding register window accomplishes that. So this function used two local registers. It read the parent's registers. It wrote its return values directly where the parent wants it, does its work, and then it returns from the function, also returning the register stack back to where it was marked. So now this parent function still has its complete register state. It's the function it called, read all the registers it needed for input. It directly mutated the caller's register, the call, yeah, the caller is a register uh, for its return value with like no copying. And all that it's done is adjusted the value of the X register in the 6502 code. So I, I'm quite happy with this. Um, like I said, um, other CPU systems have done this in very limited uh, and, and coarse-grained fashions. And I think when you just expose this model uh, to the code itself, you can get some really, really efficient designs. So every piece of data, um, whether it's intermediate or it's being passed or returned, or you know, it has its own place where you can reuse it as opposed to you know, copying on the stack. Uh, it can be operated on in place. This acts like sto local stack frames, but all operations work directly within this stack. You know, like a, a C model has the stack where it allocates you know, local variables, but then it's got to pull it into CPU registers, do the computation there, write it back out. This, this is sort of like a cross between a register frame and stack frames. So again, I think this uh, works pretty cool. The frames are all dynamically allocated in zero page space, and the, uh, all the functions are automatically re-entrant. They all get their own local copy. If you nest them, they will just grow more registers for that copy of the function call, even if that function has been called earlier in the stack chain. So and this simply does less work than both fixed register file systems, and uh, you know because it doesn't have to copy and restore stuff. And in many cases, this does less work, issues less instructions, fewer instructions, than stack machines if they are reusing intermediate values and always having to throw them back onto the top of the stack. So what actually goes on in doing the work against these registers? Because I have an orthogonal register set, and I don't want my instructions simply to say add R1 to R2 and put the result in R3 or something like that, because that's way too much decode. It makes my, my instruction implementations too complex and too slow for the, what the 6502 can do. So what I do is I keep track of the last register written, and I call that RP for the prior register. I, you know, initially, this was for doing branching, like branch if the value is zero, branch if it's negative, you know, these sorts of things we do in 6502 as well. So if you just hold on to the location of where you wrote last, you can test that at the time of the branch call. You don't have to always calculate the N flag and the Z flag. If anybody's written 6502 emulators, you know, you're constantly calculating these flag values that probably in the majority of cases won't even be read, and that's a lot of wasted work. So if we just hold on to where our last calculated value was, we can have our branch instructions know where to perform the tests of what they want to branch on. But now that we have this pointer, why don't we just use that as the accumulator? So wherever the prior register is, well, maybe I want to continue working on that across multiple instructions. So that's what I do. And this register, this prior pointer, can point to any of the registers, so any of the registers visible can become the accumulator without copying any data around. All that I do is move a single 8-bit pointer that uh, points into zero page. 
works for me. Now, obviously, you know, this is a wonderful little clever invention that I came up with. I was unfamiliar with the RCA1802 chip, which was presented last year with the Cosmac and stuff. And then it does exactly this, you know, way back in the 70s or whatever. So you know, hopefully the idea of selecting which register you want to be the accumulator isn't going to be too unfamiliar uh, for some people. So some sample code here. If I want to increase, increment the, uh, the prior value, I don't even have to have any parameters on this instruction. And it can address any of the registers visible depending on where uh, the prior value is stored. So if I run inc p, it happens to increment r0 here. If I want to do stuff with r2, there's a single command called with r2. rp pops over to point to there. Now, any instruction that I issue is going to work on that register completely orthogonally. So if I want to add r0 into the prior value that I calculated, again, I only need a single parameter, and it will take the value of r0 and add it into r2. And then, as I was talking about the branch instructions, now I named all of my instructions as Acheron such that they never conflict with 6502, because they can be listed in line with 6502 as you flip between 8 and 16-bit instructions, depending on what you need. So I'm in branch positive to some label. It'll just look at RP, whatever the last value calculated was. That won't be uh, valid. Some more instruction examples. Store in memory the last value um, to the address held in R1. So that will store AAFF into location 0103. Now, hearkening back to what I said before about looking at what the 6502 offers us and exposing that to the high-level design, this is something that I haven't seen a lot of 16-bit things do, where I, you know how in zero page, you can have a zero page pointer, and you can indirect that comma y. So you can consider that some zero page pointer holds a pointer to a structure, and then you can index into that structure without changing the, uh, the value in that pointer itself. So that's why I'd expose here for structure access. In most 16-bit environments, you often end up saying, OK, here's where my structure is. Let's copy that value, do a 16-bit add operation to index to my slot within that pointer, or within that pointed to object, and then dereference this. Now, if I want to access a different slot, I've got to copy that again, do a 16-bit add on that value, and then use that as an address again. Here, all I do is keep R1 consistent, and by adding a parameter, which is very easily decoded because it just gets copied into the Y register, I get full you know, pointer offset addressing in my 16-bit environment without changing the value and without having to compute the, the effective address manually, which, you know, again, to me, that stands to reason, but very few of the 16-bit uh, environments have done that on 6502. And of course, doing absolute addressing is important for keeping instruction dispatch count down, because if you have to load a register with your absolute address and then indirect through that, you know, there's a lot of overhead for working with, with uh, fixed locations. So, you know, here I have uh, lost my place in my notes. <laughs> so, yeah. So for those paying attention, apparently I wasn't. Um, I pointed all these places and kind of the pain points that were a bunch of overhead. But if you look at that with instruction, it could appear quite frequently in this code, because it's not like you're going to do all of your operations with only one register. You've got all these registers to work with. So that with instruction will appear multiple times in the code. Isn't that kind of overhead in the exact same way that all this other stuff was? Well, yeah, but <laughs> let's go back to the dispatch, considering that the with instruction will be called very often. This is the core of Acheron's 8-bit dispatch. Um, here I have a, a jump table of plain vectors pointing to you know, opcode 0's implementation, opcode 1 implementation, and so on for all of the opcodes. And whatever opcode value I have, I self-modify a pointer in this table somewhere, such that if this is 0, it goes to the first opcode. This is 2, it goes to the second opcode. So that's about the fastest dispatch you can have. Obviously, more goes on, but that's kind of the kernel of it. Now, because those 
all of those vectors are two bytes. Every offset really needs to be even, which means that we only have seven bits of effective opcode. Now, seven bits isn't bad. I mean, you think about the 6502 itself, it only has 151 documented instructions, which isn't much more than, than 128. But if you take out the ones you really never use, like you know, the overflow flag and various addressing modes on the bit instruction and decimal mode and stuff like that, you can easily see that most of your programs use less than 128 instructions. And Acheron explicitly promotes editing the instruction set um, to your own specific needs per project. So with these 128 um, potential opcodes that I can dispatch to, this is what I do with the, uh, with the encoding while still keeping it really small and fast. I encode the, the seven bits of the opcode and the lower seven bits, and I have my width flag there. It's a single shift. And what that shift does, it places the opcode um, in the right even position for dereferencing the jump table, and it places the width in the carry flag. And if that bit is set, then I perform that width operation, which moves where the current act currently active register is, right in the dispatcher. It is not a separate instruction. It is not a separate dispatch overhead. So let me show an example of how this is encoded. Here's store to memory to address R1. That's two byte instruction. And as you might figure out, let's assume that store memory is opcode 1F. The opcodes are automatically assigned by the system. You don't have to fiddle with any of that. And then two, obviously, is the offset to R1. So that's a, a two byte instruction that makes sense. If you do it with some other register store, that this actually combines into a single three byte instruction. So you can see the store memory was 1F, and this is still store memory 1F, except that the high bit has been set. Then we have which register goes to the width, and then the standard parameters that go to the instruction we're dispatching to. So this is a single dispatch, the, this you know, kind of common overhead style width instruction takes only one bit in the encoding, which is fine because we have a bit free anyway. And when the dispatcher runs, it runs that functionality, consumes this parameter, and leaves the instruction pointer here for the store memory instruction to continue on. The store memory instruction is completely oblivious that this with handling occurs. The dispatcher in the system takes care of it completely transparently. And using a with instruction only adds 11 cycles to the handling, which is far less than even um, Acheron's dispatch, which is about twice as fast as fourth, about three times as fast as, um, as Suite 16. So to me, this really, 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 the com combination of this prior register, the sliding register windows, you know, how functions and everything interact, I'm really getting to the point where, yes, this is small, this is fast, and this is powerful, no compromises. All the overhead that I talked about is kind of congealed and condensed in this single width instruction, and the width instruction has been optimized in the system to about its theoretical minimum of cycles it could take. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm pretty darn happy with how that's ending up. The, um, of course, this is kind of the, the core of the system the dispatcher, the opcode encoding. Uh, let's talk about some of the other instructions. Uh, the current instruction set is 109 opcodes. Uh, well, I could bring it up here, but uh, I didn't have that ready. I'll go through some of them. There's a, a C style data stack. So within a function, you say, hey, give me 150 bytes and directly index into that. Because our register stack is in zero page, um, that space is kind of at a premium. You don't want to overload that with too many with data structures themselves. So you know, I have simple stack management um, and a global page where you can put your global variable, sort of like um, zero page in 6502. I've got full multiply and divide, like many have. Um, by multiplying 16 by 16 into a 32-bit value and then dividing a 32-bit value back into 16-bit quotient and remainder, you can do semi-floating point stuff. If you have a floating point value that you can express as a ratio between a 16-bit numerator and denominator, you can take a value, multiply it by the numerator, divide it by the denominator, lose no precision, 
and basically um, scale a number by any quote unquote floating point as well as having the advantage of the integer things. Uh, carry stack is just another example of using what the 6502 already offers. Um, in, an, in an emulator, in a VM environment, you calculate something like an add or a shift, and you've got the carry value, and well, you save the carry value into byte somewhere, and so that your system can test for it later. And you save it by like rotating it into a byte. Well, there's times in 6502 coding where you do an operation that sets the carry flag that you want to test, but then you do something else which tramples the carry flag, and then you need to test it down here, so you need to save it and restore it into a pain in the butt. As we're shifting the carry into this stored byte, it works like a stack of the last eight carry instructions. And so if we pop one off, we can look back in the history of the carry. So that saves a lot. It's not that often that that's used, but it comes for free, and it, it's just as fast. <laughs> it's just as small, but it's more powerful than just have, continuing on the same notion of a single carry flag instead of a carry stack. Again, the 6502 gives us that for free by how we save the carry stack in any normal bytecode or emulation format. Uh, the try-catch, finally, I want to talk about that a bit, to handle exception, exceptions properly. Um, in the system, when I throw, the, the object that you throw is a 16-bit number. And then as your code runs, you can register a catch handler on the stack so they can nest. And as you exit the scope, you pop that catch handler. And when a catch handler gets thrown to, it receives a 16-bit number in one of the registers that gets, that gets grown for it. It tests to see if that 16-bit number is one it cares about. If it does, it handles it. If it doesn't, it rethrows and it pops the next exception handler off the stack. So this works really, really well with this register model, with, this, with the sliding windows, um, and with you know, testing the, the current or prior value. Um, a finally operation, you uh, register a catch handler. When you receive a catch, you just do your cleanup operation and rethrow the number. I mean, you don't ca care about what the exception is, you just care that you run your, uh, run your cleanup code as the exception propagates down. So I mean, this is a very, very high level you know, language feature that isn't technically all that old. I don't know, you could argue what it is, but like Senby was talking about um, in the Gecko S, a lot of his code is error handling and error checking. And a lot of people say, like at least in corporate code and you know, properly architected code, up to 80% of code is error handling. And so if you're constantly doing that in the 6502 code that we want to be small because we want to leave the memory space open for our user data or for multitasking stuff, this can really bring a lot of power and a lot of reduction in size of the, uh, of the footprint. And it tends to be faster because you're doing much fewer checks for error codes. Um, these next couple are instructions that combine um, uh, lower level instructions together, like a case jump. If the prior value is one, two, three, four, or whatever constant, then jump to this handler. And you can just concatenate this. Here's a case of one number, jump to this handler one. A case for this other number, jump to handler two. So you can have entire switch case bodies almost directly represented in the assembly code of Acron VM. You know, deck loop is another convenience. Whatever the prior number is, see if you can decrement by one without underflowing. And if you can, then loop back. And it combines all of this into a much more optimized uh, system than, than executing two separate instructions with their dispatches and with all their calculations. I've got conversion you know, f from hex and to hex. For instance, if you have a single byte here, and this only looks at the, the lower byte of a word, it'll convert it to 4631. So what is that? That's the bytes 3146, because it's a little endian, which happens to be the ASCII string 1F. And so, you know, handy things for, for printing to the screen. And again, um, by promoting the use of writing your own instructions, and even with all the ones that I wrote, which is quite full featured, including, you know, all this stuff with a try catch and the memory allocation and stuff like that, still only 109 opcodes. Um, you know, even with all of that, the runtime size is less, I and mean, this is base 10, this is not hexadecimal, it's 1900 bytes, still under 2K. So you know, I think I've, I've come upon a representation and an execution model that is small, it is fast, and it is powerful, and it is embeddable. Uh, 
talking about, you know, talk about it's very easy to edit the ISA. The, um, let me bring up an example of some of these instructions. So I have not and negate, and they share a body of code, depending on some of the value of the carry flag. So what you do to create your own instructions in here, uh, x points into the, uh, the prior register. And so it's very easy to address in the zero page. You write your code, which implements the register, and jump back. Also, the only thing you have to do is write this single line of metadata. And that places this operation. It gives it a name, describes what its parameters are, what category it is in the documentation. It adds it to all the dispatch tables. It adds it to the documentation. It adds it to the include file, which gives you the macro called not or the macro called negate. And also, what you have to do for any of the built ins is just comment this out, and it's gone. The two or one or however many instructions that you uh, may not use are gone from the footprint completely. I, I have bundled some of these in, uh, in defined clauses. So if you don't want exceptions, you just turn that off. All the exceptions are gone from the system. The runtime becomes small. You have many more opcodes available. So it's, it's super, super simple in this, in this build system to, uh, to add and remove opcodes. It is embeddable, just like Suite 16 is. So again, you can hop between. Um, I have to misalign somehow. You can hop between 8-bit uh, and 16-bit code. So you can have a 6502 program that you can pop into 16-bit uh, code for simple or for short spans that need some higher level representation. And uh, you can write big 16-bit programs that have you can drop into 6502 for the fast little uh, portions that they need. So this does not take over your, your address space, you know, kind of like fourth in some of these bigger language environment does. You can define your own space because in 6502, we take over the address space. We control the hardware. We don't necessarily want to work under somebody else's framework, because that tends to being slower, slightly different than what we want to do, and gets in our way. Uh, this whole thing is implemented in 60, CA65 macros. So you just all the power, all the tools, all the expressions, all the labels, all the macros that CA65. You can use just as much in your Acron code as in your 6502 code. This is intended to be task switchable because the zero page is all one continuous span. Its CPU stack is all one continuous span. You can just copy those in and out, sort of like Gekos. And this has zero overhead interrupt and single stepping. And by zero overhead, I mean there are no tests to do this in the main loop. When you enable in an interrupt, it self modifies the dispatcher <laughs> to jump to the handler. So it will always stop cleanly in between instructions in a nice, you know, safe, clean state, run your code to do whatever debug stuff you want to do, and then continue on. So that is what I've been doing for years in a ridiculous deep dive of optimization and thinking outside the box. Um, I did release a version in 2012, but didn't really tell too many people because I wasn't super happy about it. But the way that this has come together at this point. I'm getting quite happy with it. I think it's, it's worth presenting. Uh, the code is about to be uploaded to GitHub. I've got a few documentation issues to go on. So that is where I've had a lot of fun and ridiculous, pedantic optimization that I do apart from my real work, which is much more practical. So any questions? <laughs> I've got a little bit of time. Or is this entirely too complex? to understand in a simple little, entirely too tired presentation. <laughs> I mean, I don't really have a question. I'm just, this is impressive. <laughs> Very nice work. I, I, I can't believe how well you've aligned um, the, the VM itself to the architecture of 6502 to make it behave like a more sophisticated CPU. Mm. That's impressive. Yeah, in, in the beginning, I'm like, OK, well, this is going to be you know, have a Z80 version and whatever, it'll be totally cross CPU and whatnot. But like I say, at some point you're conflicting with the implementation of, of your, your lower level assembly code. And you, I think it's better to mutate 
how it's defined to better map that. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, great work and great explanation. Have you been able to apply this to like um, a good example? Is, is there something you're dying to apply this to? Yeah, like I said, um, editors, uh, game level editors with really complex you know, flags and, and dynamic bits. Uh, GUI is a big one. Um, I've, I've had GUI prototypes and mockups for a very long time. I had a lot of tooling for my prior kind of 2012 version of Acheron. Um, I've been banging at this trying to get it complete for release here. Um, so I haven't been able to, to write a lot of the code. But yeah, specifically, you know, editors, you know, tools, so you can do a lot of, of I mean, we want complex and full-featured and powerful applications, right? I mean, it's easy to write a simple application that does something very simple and very tiny. You know, that's not a problem. But to do bigger things while still staying on these platforms <laughs> is convenient to do it on platform. And I think this will enable um, some more higher level features. But like I said, editors and GUIs are definitely where this is going for me, personally. Uh, can you explain the carry stack a little more? And is it addressable? Like a lot of times you'll want to shift eight times and then or the result with something instead of just looking at the individual flags? Yeah, let me, uh, let me bring up. I don't want to take too much time here. But um, yeah, I, I won't look for that. So when you do an add, it pushes a carry, the carry bit, into a byte. When you do branch of carry set or branch of carry clear, it looks at the top bit of that byte. So again, if you push three things, um, if you have run three add operations, you want to look at the add operation carry output from two add operations ago, you would pop two things off the carry stack. And again, I can optimize and change the instruction set so you can specifically address a certain one. And then it will pull a prior carry bit back to the bit seven, which is easily testable. So again, you know, this is sitting at bit seven. You do another operation, then that will be at bit six. You do another operation, that'll be at bit five. So I mean, they do stick around. The problem is, you know, how do you get back to the history? And that's just exposing. I don't expose the byte itself, but I expose um, you know, branching off of the carry state, adding with the carry state as an input, and popping, if I didn't say that already, um, ignored carry bits off there. So. Cool, thank you very much.